The Old Testament reading for this, the festival of Pentecost, is taken from the prophet Ezekiel, the 37th chapter, the first verse. Ezekiel says, The hand of the Lord was upon me, and he brought me out by the Spirit of the Lord and set me in the middle of the valley. It was full of bones. He led me back and forth among them, and I saw a great many bones on the floor of the valley, bones that were very dry. He asked me, Son of man, can these bones live? I said, O oh, sovereign Lord, you alone know. And then he said to me, Prophesy to these bones and say to them, Dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. This is what the sovereign Lord says to these bones. I will make breath enter you, and you will come to life. I will attach tendons to you and make flesh come upon you and cover you with skin. I will put breath in you, and you will come to life. Then you will know that I am the Lord. And so I prophesied as I was commanded, and as I was prophesying, there was a noise, a rattling sound, and the bones came together, bone to bone. I looked, and tendons and flesh appeared on them, and skin covered them, but there was no breath in them. And then he said to me, Prophesy to the breath, prophesy, son of man, and say to it, This is what the sovereign Lord says. Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe into these slain, that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, breath entered them. They came to life and stood up on their feet, a vast army. And then he said to me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. They say, Our bones are dried up and our hope is gone. We are cut off. Therefore prophesy and say to them, This is what the Sovereign Lord says. O oh, my people, I am going to open your graves and bring you up from them. I will bring you back to the land of Israel. Then you, my people, will know that I am the Lord when I open your graves and you bring, and bring, them, bring you up from them. I will put my spirit in you, and you will live, and I will settle you in your own land. Then you will know that I, the Lord, have spoken, and I have done it, declares the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. For David did not ascend to heaven, 
And yet he said, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand till I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The rest of the reading of the Um, 
all these things reminding us is just about the outpouring of the Spirit. And so uh, the texts bring up each of these things, but in different ways. And I'd like to kind of just talk about each of the texts just a little bit here. Uh, this morning, not focus on any one, but just the whole kind of thing combined, the uh, matrixing of all these texts. Ezekiel 37, of course, is a very famous text. Notice that it is the, Ezekiel comes out in this vision to the valley, and he's brought there by the text says, by the Spirit of the Lord. And then we're told that he is uh, told to prophesy uh, to the bones. When the Lord asks him a question, can these bones live? And Ezekiel doesn't dare answer. He says, Lord, you know the answer. You tell me. I'm not going to speculate. That's probably good, good theological insight right there. Uh, Lord, you tell me. I'm not going to speculate. And the Lord says, well, watch this. Prophesy to these bones. And he does. And what the Lord promises happens. They come back to life. And then, of course, he has a prophesied the breath, which, of course, you have to know the nuance of Hebrew. The word for spirit and the word for breath are the same word. Ruach. It's the same word. And so, a play here, I think the Lord even gives a little bit of play here on the giving of the Holy Spirit, this breath uh, that is breathed into the slain. Uh, now, in this particular context, this is not speaking of directly of the resurrection on the last day, but it is speaking here uh, metaphorically of uh, Israel has, says, we have no hope, right? They're, they're coming out of the Babylonian captivity. We have no hope. <laughs> and God says, yes, you do. It's me. And he uses this imagery to paint a picture of how he's going to bring them out of captivity and, and live up to the promises that he's made to them. But, again, distinguish but don't divorce, right? This is not directly speaking of the resurrection, but it sure sounds like it, doesn't it? And we shouldn't be surprised because this is, of course, exactly what the Lord is going to do when he promises to raise us again on the last day. In fact, I use this text at funerals, oftentimes with families, because it does remind us of, the, of that fact, that the Lord's promise to resurrect, resurrect us uh, by the power of the Spirit. Uh, the resurrection. The resurrection is important, not just because it says you get to live forever, that's pretty nice, right? But also because it makes the point that God has redeemed us and that we are no longer under the curse of sin. The resurrection proves, for example, that Jesus' saving work in our behalf was valid, was complete, was totally accomplished. There's nothing left for us to do but to receive it as a gift. The book of Acts, that second reading, I'm going to move a little bit to that, makes this point. Peter says, Men of Israel, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs. And notice that accreditation by these miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did among you through him, as you yourselves know. He points to the miracles that Jesus had been doing before his crucifixion. Um, and accredited by God by miracles, wonders, and signs. In other words, I've been making this point in, in my ladies' Bible class quite often. But uh, when, the, when Peter and others begin to proclaim the gospel, you kind of have to start at the beginning. You don't jump in the deep end of the pool and start at the end. And so they don't start off by saying Jesus is the Son of God. They don't even start off by saying Jesus is the Messiah. First step is to say what? He has God's approval. Right? Why should I listen to him? Why should I care about him? He has God's approval. Accredited by miracles, wonders that God did through him, as you yourselves know. Once you make that step, then you can say, okay, but let me tell you a little more. He's not only like one of the prophets, like Ezekiel, who we know was sent from God, or Isaiah, who we know was sent from God, but he is also then the Messiah. He's the one all the prophets were speaking about. But all their conversation was about what all the things they said was leading to. Was this Christ, this Messiah? And then after you accept that, then he can say what? Well, and by the way, he's the Son of God. God come in the flesh. 
God didn't send an angel to pay for your sins. God didn't have somebody else do his dirty work. But in the, in the mystery of the Trinity, he himself becomes flesh, one of us, to pay for our sins. And so we shouldn't be surprised that he doesn't start off with that. Peter continues in his sermon, This man was handed over to you by God's set purpose and foreknowledge. This was God's plan all along. And you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. Notice he doesn't shy away from saying what they've done. But God raised him from the dead. You notice this becomes usually how Scripture speaks of Jesus being raised from the dead. It's God's doing, which fits that pattern I was telling you about, right? First you have to say he's accredited by God. God raised him from the dead. That shows he's accredited by God. If, God, if he wasn't, God would not have raised him from the dead. But God did. And so 90% of the time in scriptures, the scriptures speak of Jesus being raised by the Father. However, there are other places in scripture where you, when you learn a little more, where we're told that the Spirit raises Jesus from the, from the grave, and in fact, that Jesus raises himself. John's Gospel, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it again. John tells us the temple he was talking about was his body. Jesus raises himself from the dead. Of course, this is more, next Sunday's Holy Trinity Sunday. We'll hear more about the Trinity and that, and that relationship between Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But this is how Scripture speaks and how it does normally because it's getting its foot in the door with its audience. But God raised him the dead, freeing him from the agony of death. Death is the great sign of our sinfulness. And that this life is not what it's all about. <clears throat> when death stares you in the face, you finally realize and begin to understand this life is not what it's all about. Because if it is, man is a short. And the clock ticks faster and faster the older you get. But he was freed from the agony of death because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him because of God's foreknowledge. He then quotes one of the prophets, David in his role as a prophet, said about him, I saw the Lord always before me because he's at my right hand, I will not be shaken. Therefore my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. And then he says, my body also will live in hope because you will not abandon me to the grave, nor will you let your Holy One see decay. And then he goes on and he says, Brothers, I can tell you confidently that the patriarch David died and was buried, and his tomb is here to this day. But he was a prophet and knew that God had promised him on oath that he would place one of his descendants on his throne. Seeing what was ahead, he spoke of the resurrection of the Christ, that he was not abandoned to the grave, nor did his body see decay. And by the way, this is one of the moves that happens, actually, interpretive moves that happens between the Old Testament and the New Testament. Um, in the New Testament, most of the times this way. In the Old Testament, things oftentimes are less literal. They become more literal in the New Testament. Uh, this is the case here. David says this about himself. He's not being abandoned. Ultimately, that's true, right? David will be raised again on the last day, right? Uh, and his body does not see decay in the sense of he will have a new resurrected body when Christ returns. So there, it's not quite fully literal. But now Peter says what? But this actually plays to Jesus, which is literal. He is not abandoned in the grave, and his body does not see decay. And you see this move happening quite often in, in scriptures uh, from the Old to the New Testament, because it's applied to Christ. So, for example, Israel is God's son, Old Testament. Not fully literal. Jesus is God's Son. Literally. See the move? This is the interpretive move that is made between the Old and New Testament. Um, and so Jesus Christ. And it says, God has raised this Jesus to life. And then notice again, this emphasis on what God is doing because we're making a point he's accredited by God. And we are all witnesses of the fact. Exalted to the right hand of God, he has received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit and has poured out what we now see and hear. And this is the first Pentecost, what they're seeing. 
Uh, for David did not ascend into heaven, yet he said, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Therefore, let all Israel be sure of this. God has made this Jesus whom you crucified. And now here comes the next move. Both Lord and Christ. So once you accept the other, now I can tell you the rest of the story. And he is the Lord and Christ. So much so... That Jesus speaks in this way as if he is indeed God himself. Various times in Holy Scriptures we see this. For example, uh, when Jesus says things like this, You have heard it said by the ancients, but I say to you. Well, who does Jesus think he is? He almost sounds like he wrote this stuff. He did. <laughs> he is the Son of God. <laughs> right? He makes incredible claims. If any man wants to come after me, he must deny himself and follow me. Anybody who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. You must hate your parents. No prophet can say that to you. No prophet can demand such allegiance. They can demand it of you of God, but not of themselves. Jesus speaks and acts as if he is God, the Son of God. And he is. And so in the gospel lesson, we see that very same thing happening again. On the last and greatest day of the feast, this is the Feast of uh, Booths uh, that they're celebrating. And they would uh, pour out water to remind them of the rock, the water coming from the rock. This is when they would pour out the water. And so Jesus, seeing all this, says in a loud voice, If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. He doesn't say, let him come to God. Let him come. To me. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, streams of living, living water will flow from within him. And by this he meant the Spirit, whom those who believed in were later to receive. And then John says, Up at that time the Spirit had not been given since Jesus had not yet been glorified. I'll talk about that in a second. But notice that Jesus claims here that he is the one who will create this living water. And he does it through the Holy Spirit. In us. He gives us the water of salvation, and then that wells up in us to give to others. I, I kind of put it this way. You ever have something, a, a, a bucket overflow? Ever run of water? Or on anything? Right? Aquarium. Turn that off. There goes that water. Right? It takes in so much, and then what happens? It overflows. It's got to go somewhere as the Spirit works in our life. Faith and love, it's got to go somewhere, and it wells up and it flows out to others. The Lord has his way with our hearts and our minds as he reminds us of what he's done for us, as he shows us his love for us again and again and again. And that then overflows and abounds to others. It cannot overflow and abound to others from us unless it's first in us and happening to us. But where it's happening, it will overflow. Or in the words of Jesus, a bad tree can't produce good fruit. A good tree only can produce good fruit. What happens, we become believers, and then we share that with others. We talk about the Holy Spirit working faith in our hearts and um, uh, creating these impulses, spiritual impulses. <clears throat> Take a look for a minute at uh, hymn 236. The last song we sang. Find that. I'll talk about it here in a second. Be looking for that while I'm talking. Now, in the gospel lesson, he says that uh, the Spirit was to be received and had not been given. This is a case of the effects of the Spirit of, this is what's called synecdoche. Uh, part for the whole or whole for the part. When we say, that's a nice set of wheels. We're not talking about the tires, we're talking about the whole car, right? Part of the car is mentioned for the whole thing. Or, in some places, the whole for the part looks like weather. Yeah, every day it looks like weather, what's your point? But the whole weather stands for what? Bad weather, right? Kind of thing. When he says the spirit has not been given, spirit is a place, of part of the, it's the whole for the part. In other words, the spirit in a particular aspect and way that would be fulfilled in Pentecost. Uh, the Spirit comes at Pentecost to do exactly 
what we heard uh, was said of Jesus when his miracles. Go back to that Acts text. Men of Israel, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs. Accreditation, proof. Pouring out of the Holy Spirit did the same thing. It was accrediting the work of the apostles and that what Christ had done was true. Not only that, it stood as a sign also for what was later to be taught to the disciples, which was this. That salvation was not just for Israel, the Jews, but for all people. Remember, they speak in tongues they've not studied or learned, right? All these different languages. In the book of Revelation, what do we have around the throne of God? Peoples of every nation, every tribe, every language, right? And so uh, Pentecost begins then to remind the church and to, to prompt the church that this is not just for the Jews, but for all people. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. So when it says the Spirit was not given, it means in that capacity. It cannot mean the Spirit wasn't given at all. We just saw what? In Ezekiel... That's why it's great to have this text here. What the Holy Spirit brings into this valley. The Holy Spirit, he prophesies, right? So the Holy Spirit is around and active in the Old Testament. And it's even around when Jesus is walking on earth. But this spectacular demonstration of the power uh, that is done on Pentecost had not yet been accomplished because Jesus had to first die and be raised from the dead. Now, by the way, um, what God does in any particular era, I said we divorce, don't divorce, we distinguish, right? Uh, God's power, he, he manifests it in different ways at different times. Because he manifested it at one way at one time doesn't mean he's going to manifest it that way at another time. Or even this, if he's told you to do something in one place doesn't mean necessarily somebody else in another place has to do it. Or that even you have to do it another time, Right? And so, for example, when things have fulfilled their purpose, they're no longer required. We talk about, I started the sermon talking about the Old Testament and New Testament. What's the difference? Well, one applies to us directly and one no longer applies to us directly. Right? We are in a new covenant. The old covenant included things like circumcision, clean and unclean food laws, uh, various things like this, of this nature. Which in the New Testament, because they've been fulfilled, they've served their purpose, they pointed forward to the Messiah. And because the Messiah has now come, they no longer are required. And we no longer need to do them. So too, the granting of this Holy Spirit in a spectacular fashion at Pentecost doesn't mean that the Holy Spirit has to be doing that all the time. Or that he promises even to continue to do that all the time. We know this historically from the standpoint of this, that between the Old Testament and New Testament, we call that the intertestamental period. You know how long that is? That's 400 years. There is no prophet. There is no prophecy. Why do you think people are so excited when John the Baptist shows up on the scene? There hasn't been a prophet. There hasn't been prophecy. There hasn't been this sort of thing for 400 years. So there's no guarantee that all these things that happened on Pentecost are given to us. Now, trust me, when I was going through seminary, that gift of languages, I would have liked that because I spent a lot of time learning Greek and Hebrew. It wasn't easy. It would have been nice just to go, back. Ah, no Greek and Hebrew. Hey, that's good. No, it wasn't that way. It wasn't that way. Um, but what the Holy Spirit does continue to do is sown in the hymn. They actually look at that in 236. Look at verse 3. Plenteous of grace descend from high, rich in thy sevenfold energy. Uh, we talk about the sevenfold spirit for the book of Revelation. Now here it comes. Make us eternal truths receive. That's the working of the Holy Spirit. He makes us receive them. Um, we said at the beginning of the service, I cannot by my own reason or strength believe in Jesus Christ, but I've been called by the gospel by the Holy Spirit, enlightened with his gifts, right? All those that words. He is the one who causes us to accept in childlike faith the teachings of the scripture. That continues today. The Holy Spirit's work. And that's part of that dwelling up of waters. As we believe and trust in, the, in our Lord's word, we share that with others. 
And that desire to share goes on. And practice all that we believe. The Holy Spirit does that too. As we receive uh, Him and are strengthened by the Holy Spirit through the means of grace, just as in the Old Testament they had their means of grace, their sacraments, so too in the New Testament. Baptism, holy absolution, a few moments, the Lord's Supper, where the Holy Spirit creates the faith in our hearts, and that wells up into a spring of water that flows to others. Thanks be to God. And now with the peace of God, which surpasses all human understanding, keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus always. Amen.